My name is Gary Bontrager. I'm your host at Mindset Growth Podcast. I have Heather, my co-host, with me today. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Awesome. It's a wonderful fall day here in Iowa. It's starting to finally feel like fall. It is. Without much further ado, we're going to bring in a guest that I am super excited about having on the podcast. Uh, this is a person I've gotten to know over the years. I couldn't tell you for sure how long ago. Uh, part of it because we worked in the same industry and also just with our kids playing sports, uh, his kids being a different age, but we still ended up in the same facility sometimes and would get to know them that way. Um, the story that resonates to me is how somebody can experience such tragedy, but use that platform in order to try to serve and help others. Uh, probably one thing that makes it dear to me is the fact I've lost my father when I was 15 years old. And so I understand some of that grieving process. And when I see people go through and put so much effort into it and serve others out of that experience, it's so inspiring. And I hope that this inspires you as much as it has me. So without any further ado, I want to welcome Craig Schroeder to Mindset Growth Podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. So I'm going to, uh, a lot of times when we get started, we have some rapid fire questions. It's just kind of loosen things up and ask some random questions. Heather's always the one who puts these together. So I'm going to let her start with that. And then we'll start in a little bit about where you grew up and how you ended in Iowa City and take it, take it from there. But, uh, all right. I got one for you just to get to know you a little bit. Um, when you have time to relax, what's your favorite thing to do? That is an excellent question. Uh, spend time with the family um, probably is number one. Um, we like to vacation and travel. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, that's usually where I get to relax. Yeah. Um, in town, I don't get to relax very often. And that's usually because I'm signing up to do something and, uh, and away from any five minutes of free time that I have. So when we get out of town, and, and that's usually my favorite thing is to sit back. Otherwise, I love watching uh, um, baseball. So ball. baseball, softball, um, in person on TV, those are things that, uh, um, you know, or maybe some movies with the wife. So, yeah, yeah. you mentioned family who, who mm -hmm. travels with you. So as much as we like to, we like to travel with our immediate family. So, uh, my wife, uh, Stacy, um, which I nicknamed Foxy by the way, <laughs> um, and, uh, our, our other, uh, kids, uh, um, Cody, uh, nicknamed Seabone and Haley nicknamed Kiki. Um, so, uh, that's the family that we have and, and, uh, um, and we do it like to travel with some of our other extended family. And then mm -hmm. we are ones that we have a lot of family. Um, and so there's a lot of really, really close friends that have been friends for a long time that, that had kids that grew up with us and our, our kids and, and, uh, um, Austin as well, um, with flash. Right. So. Wonderful. Awesome. I, uh, I think that's going to be the theme that I, when I think of you, I think of you as a family man, connected, well-rounded. Your family seems very, spends a lot of time together. So do you have another one? Yeah, I do. And this I kind of um, picked because I know superheroes were, were big uh, for Austin, I believe. Yeah. So what would be your favorite superhero? Of course it would be Flash. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's, that's kind of a no brainer before, um, you know, Austin ever got the nickname before Austin ever got sick or anything like that. You know, I grew up loving like Superman, right. you know, why would you not? Right. You know, it, it's like one of the most powerful and the most dynamic and probably the most, you know, I guess, you know, diverse type of a superhero that has all of these different powers. And then of course you just get to wear like, you know, basically America colors in a way, right. Mm -hmm. With the red and blue. Right. And, yep. and, uh, that was always kind of mine probably growing up was, was Superman. So awesome. So to dive into it a little bit, uh, you're not a local resident, Iowa mm -hmm. city. So tell us a little bit about where you come from and what brought you to this point. Uh, audience often likes to know, Get a little background from where you're from. Yeah, um, I was born and raised in Postville, Iowa, a small town in northeast Iowa yes. uh, by Decora, by Luther College, if, if some of the listeners might know where that might be then. Um, Postville, very small town, about a thousand people growing up. Um, and uh, and 
you know, in that town, you were either Lutheran, Catholic, or Presbyterian, and that's really what it was. Mm -hmm. um, my dad uh, sold cars for about 18 years at John Fob Motors, and then uh, one day when ownership probably wasn't going to be in, in that like his future, he walked across the street and uh, to my grandpa's insurance agency, um, Schrader Insurance, and uh, said, okay, dad, um, what can I do to uh, buy you out? And so my dad became second generation um, of that insurance agency. Um, I grew up with two older brothers, um, uh, Larry, who is seven years older than me, and Mark, who is five years older than me. Um, and, uh, you know, everything we were, I mean... I love telling the stories with the kids nowadays and everything else. I grew up with no cell phones. I grew up with, you know, a phone and it was the put your finger in and you twist it around and right. you twist uh -huh. around. And if you mix it, make a mistake, you got to hang up and do, do it again. again. Yep. And it was so exciting. I remember when we got the first push button phone, mm -hmm. that was like amazing. And it was the one, the cordless that sat on the, on the end table by dad's chair. So he didn't have to get up which helped us because it usually was we had to get up off the floor, run to the other room and grab the phone and then see who it was. And so we got that phone. It was actually kind of nice sitting right next to him and he could answer it then and didn't have to get up. So, Sweet. so yeah, um, we grew up in town, um, but I had an uncle that lived literally like one mile on the edge of on the outside of town and he was a farmer. Um, so, um, you know, I, I grew up loving working on the farm, milking cows. Um, he had pigs, we, he had chickens, um, and uh, we did a lot of baling of hay. So mm -hmm. it was a lot of manual labor. Right. Um, and uh, and that's, that's, yeah, where I grew up. It's kind of crazy. It seems like, clearly, I don't think we're that old, but mm -hmm. it's almost an idealic childhood yeah. <laughs> when you look back because it's hard to get your mind around it because... I grew up on a farm as well, but my nephews have not experienced what I experienced yeah. in that in what you just described. Absolutely. It's so different now. The technology has changed a bit in farming, yeah. but mm -hmm. you mentioned the telephone. I don't I don't think that it has changed as drastically as the phone has come. Yeah, That's... absolutely. So anyway, the uh I, what brought you to Iowa City School then? And you yes. stayed? So, um, you know, a little bit about me. I, uh, I was big into sports in a small town. You know, I played four um, at any one time, and I did switch um, uh, from track to golf during it because my basketball coach was a golf coach. But uh, um, uh, played a lot of sports. I remember walking upstairs with my dad going, okay, I'm being recruited. It's my senior year. And so it's like, you know, what do I do? And so he's like, well, I'm not going to go on any visits with you. If you're going to go, you're going to go. And, and so I went to a couple of smaller school visits and, and people, you know, would ask me about coming for football and, and basketball. Um, and, uh, I really wasn't getting looks for any bigger school. Um, but again, you know, this was, you were lucky to maybe be in the newspaper back then. There was right. no social media, no nothing. And no one could ever really, really hear about you being up in Northeast Iowa. And I remember after I went on a couple of visits, I came to him and I said, I don't know what to do. And he goes, well, you're never going to be good enough to play past college. So if I was you, I'm not paying for any school. I would go to Iowa. It's the cheapest. And I would go down there and get a job. And that's what you got to do. You got to figure out how to pay for school. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, thinking back on that, it wasn't a great conversation you would love yeah. to hear. Um, you know, some people say it was tough love, and uh, but that was the generation, uh, yeah. you know, on how they felt that they are going to build strong men to be right. able to provide in the future. And you've got to give up things that you really like mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, for something that is better for the future. And and so, uh, um, sure enough, I came down to Iowa um, where it was... Uh, five thousand dollars a year with everything included and i i immediately on day two walked down the street and went to golden corral and got a job washing dishes and that was my first job in college um, interesting yeah that's uh i you know i don't know times have certainly changed tremendously i don't know if college kids work as much as they did during school uh but that was fairly common back then uh yep. you you had jobs and I know you experienced that as well, mm -hmm. but uh, it just seemed that was more of a commonplace. Yeah, I think they do. I think there's just so many different opportunities for right. kids now in college to make uh, 
kind of side job right. type stuff that weren't really there. It was more previously. physical manual labor, a lot of restaurant Absolutely. Work. So. Absolutely. And I, I did so many different jobs throughout college. But, uh, um, you know, one thing that I that, you know, for me as as a parent with my kids, I always said is, you know, if you're in sports, you know, I'm, I'm not going to force you to work because number one, school is the most important and there's going to be a commitment to sports and everything yeah. else. And and that, especially in college, is going to take you away from classes and travel. And so, uh, um, you know, I'm not going to necessarily impose you to, to work if you have those two things. If you don't do both of those, then you will get a job. And, and when my son went, to, um, Cody went to Mount Mercy and played a couple of years and ended up having sh- or, or elbow surgery, decided when he came back that he was going to be done and wanted to come to Iowa he went out and got a job selling Cutco knives um, really? and uh, he did really well for like the summer. And then he, uh, he worked for uh, um, the city of Coralville mowing. And uh, then he wanted to do something a little bit different. And he's been working at Closterman construction now and not just during the summer, he works actually the last two years, he's actually worked all the way through the school year. Oh wow! He'll get up, get up and work from like seven or seven thirty in the morning until like noon schedule his classes in the afternoon and evening. Um, and it, uh, it is a load for him. Um, but I will say he's pretty smart. He has no classes on Friday, so he can still be a college kid and go out on Thursday night. So, so yeah. You know, that's interesting. Um, the one thing I think too, is the flexibility with a lot of schools are given these kids Mm -hmm. is with the class structures is much better. Mm -hmm. I always told my kids the same thing too. If you're going to play sports, I want you as committed to that sport as you are to a job or anything. Yep. It's it's a team effort, and if you show up underperforming, it's not fair to your teammates. Hundred percent. So that was that. I think that's times have changed in that regard. Um, guess to fast forward and move into some other things, and to get to maybe uh, clearly, you ended up in insurance, and yeah. did that happen through uh, because of connections your father had, or was it more or less you were in Iowa City and college was finished and. In a, a, a- Interesting enough, um, as I jumped around and I will always, you know, I, I tell my son and my, my daughter and I tell the other younger kids that I talk to, you know, it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And it's how hard you work and how much pride you take in every single job. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked really hard washing dishes, but that connected me with somebody else that uh, um, got another job. And that connected me again with someone else that got me a different job. And from that, when I graduated and left, that didn't get me into working for Federated Mutual or anything else or, or where my next future jobs would be, but it helped me build a platform of work ethic and everything else that I grew up with. And, uh, and I tell the, the kids that it's, it's not what you know. I mean, it, it's, it's who you know that can create right. those things and, and you take pride in it. And so I had jumped around in a different, a couple of different things. One job that somebody I knew that saw what I did and thought I would be good at this in sales and everything else kind of led down the road. And, uh, and sure enough, um, Tim Lehman is a realtor in Iowa city. Yep. And actually, uh, my wife is one of the owners of edge realty and with Tim as a partner with Tim. And so as he's talking with Joe Wegman, um, and Joe was an ex-partner at uh, A.W. Walden Briscoe and in Reliant. And uh, they were just talking about, you know, perpetuation and younger owners. And Tim said, well, I, you know Craig Schrader. You know, you know him from the golf course and everything else. And he's like, you know, he's got insurance experience. He's got sales experience. He's just such a great guy. And, and so Joe's like, yeah, I, I didn't really think about him. And that's all that it took, a right. couple of phone calls and uh, – and it got me to, to switch over. And, uh, you know, that's been 20 years plus now. Is it? And yeah. So, yeah. I have been in it 25, a little over 25 years now. It yeah. kind of seems crazy how quickly that time has gone and how much that technology's changed. Yeah. Moving on, I know you had kids. And um, the thing that you uh, probably have been has been a, a, uh, an exceptional in- inspiration to the Iowa City community, but even communities beyond. And just tell us a little bit about uh, Austin, your oldest son that you mm-hmm. lost. And then you've started foundations or a foundation mm-hmm. and some things out of that. I guess that's really the piece um, that I think a lot of 
people are inspired by is how you've taken tragedy and used it as a platform. And I even just told Heather as we we're talking about this, I said, uh, the commitment from time and energy that Craig and Stacy have put mm -hmm. into this because it's not something you can do for three, four, and five years. Once you start down this road, it takes a lot of energy and time to carry that on throughout. So tell us a little bit about that story, about Austin's story, and kind of build it from there. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the shorter version of the story, number one, um, I, I'll try to take some important pieces of it. Number one, we talk about superhero, we talk about Flash. Um, sports was a big, huge part of what I was and what my kids all were, and especially Austin being, right. you know, that first son is going to run in my footsteps and he's going to be a better athlete than me, right? <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I started coaching before he was even able to play sports. And uh, uh, Mike Haight actually asked me, um, ex-Iowa football player, NFL player, asked me to coach because he just knows that I'm a big kid at heart and I love being around the kids and playing with them. And uh, when Austin was uh, seven years old, we left the like the rec league and went and joined Trojan Baseball Club. And uh, that was more of a competitor, competitive feeder program for West High School. And uh, um, it was an 8U team, and there was three younger kids that were seven. And uh, after every practice, we always like to finish something for fun. And what do kids like to do? They love to have relay races, right? And so we're, we're in, a, in a city park in North Liberty. There was no outfield fence. And so we split into two. The kids split into two teams. The first kid of each team had a baseball. They'd run out and touch an evergreen in someone's backyard. They'd come back and hand off the baseball to the next kid. We did that because young kids like to cheat and leave early on races, right? So this way, they, they couldn't leave early. They had to hand the baseball off because if they left early and dropped the ball, that team had to drop, do 10 push-ups, which was a lot for seven and eight-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And that pretty much means the race was over at that point in time. Um, so anyway, Dane uh, or Austin always liked to race Dane Randall. And Dane was an eight-year-old, and he was the fastest kid at Van Allen. And, uh, um, and so they always were the anchors and that day people were going out and back, out and back, and they got the baseball at the same time. They took off, they ran out to the tree in the backyard, touched the tree, turn around. And we were always just like, okay, Dane, at some point, he's just going to pull away from him, but he never did. And at the last second in the last second, Austin beat him by basically just a couple of inches. And, uh, one of the coaches said, oh my gosh. No one's ever beat Dane. He's like, we got to call him Flash. <laughs> and that's how he got his nickname. Yeah. And uh, um, and so for those that are listening, and that's where the nickname of a superhero came from when he was seven years old. Yeah. Right. And uh, fast forward a couple years old, uh, a couple years later, as I coached baseball, I always had a whiteboard in the dugout with me. And on that whiteboard, I had the two things that you can control, and that is our attitude and effort. Mm -hmm. In any situation, yes. it's our attitude and effort. And, uh, and on there, I also put have fun. And then the next year I put on like sportsmanship, finish strong and then, uh, teamwork. And I think two years later I had to put had fun on there as well because kids were still young and there was a lot of adversity and they weren't really still handling it all that right. good. Um, and so I think at one point I had like, I don't know, like 11 things on there and it was confusing even for the coaches and everybody else. And so you know, at 10U, the, the boys merged to form like an A team out of Trojans, out of the group. And, you know, we won a whole lot. And, uh, um, and so we ended up becoming a major team. Right. And, uh, um, and we did well at 11U. And at 12U, we started to struggle a little bit, which mm -hmm. I was okay with. I only wanted to win 50% or more of the games. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to win 90% of them by 10 runs or more. Right. Was, you're not going to learn. And just and just for clarity, yeah. for those listening, this is in the USSSA. Yep. Uh, it was that type of baseball. Yep. And so that's why, if you're listening, that's why the names are what they are. Yeah, the travel club. And, yep. and, uh, and so um, we all sat around, and uh, um, I had to come up with a theme and a motto. And I, I, I went to Notre Dame, be a champion today. And that was like, that's so fitting, right? And then, but Austin was at an early age, he was an Oregon football fan. And Oregon football had win the day. And so I sat down and I, I thought about what that was going to mean and which one meant more to me um, and could help me kind of like 
give a message to the kids every single day and also then give a message to the parents of what I'm trying to do and when the day was just so fitting. Yeah. And I, I sat the kids down and I talked to them about, you know, every single day, we don't get better if we don't work hard. If you don't show up and give me your best attitude and your best effort, we're not going to get better. And we're not going to push each other if we don't do that. And in a game, we can't take plays off. We got to give our best attitude and our best effort. But not just in sports, but if you, if you apply that in school, you know, if you do your homework assignments, if you study for every mm -hmm. quiz and everything, give your best effort, you're actually going to be able to continue to propel yourself in school. And then it's the same thing with the chores at home. Right. And later on, when you work for people, take pride in what you do, come to, come to work with the best attitude and give your best effort. Even if you might go, this job isn't that great. You know what? A different job will come up, a different opportunity will. So when the day came from that and when the day really had the whiteboard said when the day on it and it said number one attitude number two effort and number three was shake and bake <laughs> and that came right from talladega nights yes, ricky yeah. bobby and so almost all my quotes in life the ones that people think i'm funny almost all come from a movie and right. a lot of them came from a will ferrell um, yeah he's got a lot of then. good ones after every inning, we would always break things down, like a huddle to go back out in the field. And uh, um, we always typically did some kind of a funny kind of quote from a movie or something right. like that, just to make things light mm -hmm. and loose. And uh, um, two years after that was all created, we were, Austin was 14, went to Mexico, and he complained of a pain in his groin. And he showed us, and it was a big lump. It looked like a golf ball sticking out. I thought it was a hernia because I had two of those before, and that's exactly what it looked like. Um, and two days, the next day, we found out um, while we're on on spring break that Patrick McCaffrey, his buddy, had thyroid cancer and had surgery. And we're like, oh my gosh, we gotta. W as soon as we get back, we gotta go visit Patrick, and you know, and and uh, we're so worried about him. The next day to get up and travel, Austin could barely stand and walk. He was in wow. so much pain, and uh, and so. We traveled back, saw Patrick, my wife Stacy, um, took Austin to the doctor. They did a couple of x-rays, and they thought maybe um, that uh, he had scraped his right foot, that maybe it was a swollen lymph node because some kind of a bacteria, some infection. So we went to the hospital. They gave him some medication for an infection, and uh, um, within two days, he broke out uh, like with a rash over 100% of his body. It was an allergic reaction to the medication. Yeah. And, uh, um, and so they were trying to find another med for him. Three days later, his knee had swollen up three times the size of his other one. Same side as the groin. And I was at baseball practice. And I remember Stacy had to pick him up from school, take him to the doctor. They did some x-rays. And then she called and said, things look suspicious and we have to do some biopsies. And they mentioned the C word. And she said the C word that way because mm -hmm. Austin was in the vehicle. And uh, um, it always gets a little bit emotional parts right. of my story. And uh, um, especially when I saw, you know, my family, you know, yeah. and how they had to, 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 to deal with what we had to deal with. Because Austin is the oldest. How much younger are your other kids? They're all three years apart. Okay. Austin Austin, and Cody were born on Friday the 13th, three oh years and one month apart. Oh, my goodness. And then uh, and then uh, Haley was three years after that. Okay. Um, so this is impactful for them, too. Very impactful. siblings. Yeah, you're looking at 14, 11, and 8 years yeah. old at this point. And so uh, um, we sat down, Austin, on the bed the night before we were taking him to the hospital um, to do biopsies. And we talked to him about what tomorrow was going to bring, that they're going to put him under... <laughs> And they're going to do some biopsies and everything else. And when he wakes up, um, if he wakes up and, and if he has a lump in his chest, unfortunately, that means they put a chemo port in and that he would have cancer. But that's not what we're going to hope and pray for. Mm -hmm. But if that is what happens, you know, what can you can control? And he looked at me and he goes, my attitude, my effort. Yeah. And uh, I mean, man, it's like all those years, all those years of coaching right. is like, you know, did was he listening? And not only was he listening, he actually got it. He completely right. understood it. And Austin was wise beyond his years. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I always think that that is that's God's work that allowed him to be that right. way. Um, 
And so we took him in the next day and, and the doctors took him away and we just sat there and waited. And his best friend was in the room with us waiting and waiting and Dr. Miller come walking in and man, you just, you knew it wasn't good news. Right. You know, to, to hear, I'm sorry, your, your son has cancer. Um, yeah. No matter how much you prepare yourself for it, it's just, it's like, it hits you like a semi. Right. And uh, um, I remember my dad, you know, was my rock in my life, just broke down. Right. And uh, um, I'm like trying to hold him up and he is sobbing, you know, uncontrollably. And it's just like, he goes, this is not fair. And it's like, I mean, like I had to become my dad's rock at that point right. in time right. to, to help him get through it. Um, the story itself for Austin is is the shorter version of his treatment. As we went in for standard um, therapy, uh, chemotherapy, and that was a 28 day cycle. And uh, after the 28 days, we went back in, um, and uh, and the doctor sat down and and said, uh, unfortunately, the chemo is not working. Uh, the cancer is still growing at a fast rate. In fact, it's not in the groin and the knee, it's in the stomach and the chest. Um, and uh, I guess I failed to tell you that uh, um, the diagnosis was T-cell lymph lymphoblastic lymphoma. It was okay. a blood cancer. Okay. And uh, um, they, they initially thought it would be a sarcoma because of the knee. And, uh, um, but the day that they told us it was the lymphoma blood cancer would be a 92% success rate. Um, if it was a sarcoma, they would have to amputate his leg and he would have had about a 64% chance. So we actually felt blessed to, to have the cancer right. that he got right. um, with a diagnosis um, and the prognosis, I should say. And so um, after the 30 days, they gave us the bad news. Um, immediately, they took the game the game book and mm -hmm. they threw it in the garbage. And then we said, we are now going to have to start finding something. They, they collaborated with uh, Sloan Kettering in New York, who had a study going on for T cell, um, lympho, uh, blastic lymph, uh, lymphoma patients. And so the university here, amazing, agreed to do the same treatment with the same drugs here. So we wouldn't have to leave to go to New York. I was wondering if it was at yeah. the university here. Or... And and that was an amazing thing because Austin said, I don't want to leave. Uh, yeah. I, I, I want to stay here. That's where my family and friends are. And mm -hmm. and that's something that so many families have to deal with. If mm -hmm. something here doesn't work or if there's not a treatment that's available here and they have to go to some other hospital that has a special treatment, that means you're uprooting the family. Right. And, uh, you know, if we would have went there, it could have been for six months. It could have been for longer um, and that means one of us isn't working right. and yeah. one of us is with them. And that means the brother and sister and the grandparents and the cut, nobody gets to see them, right. you know, and that takes out half of your support system. It takes, it takes everything out. And yeah. so, so we were blessed, um, and Austin and had a three week window, um, that we got to go to, uh, um, a St. Louis Cardinals game and get on the field. Okay. Um, and, uh, we went with our, our friends, the Johnsons and the McCaffrey family, and okay. uh, which was great. The next weekend, we got to go to the All-Star Game um, in Minnesota, which was an amazing experience. And then he also got to play his one and only baseball tournament as a 14-year-old. 14 uh, 14 oh, um, and uh, right after that, we went in, and, and we went in for a bone marrow transplant. And that was the next thing, phase. The, the, the chemo treatment that came from New York it another 28 days and it only worked for the first about two weeks and then he had a bad reaction um neurological he, he couldn't speak couldn't get words out and so we had to stop that treatment immediately um because they were afraid that it could be it could kill him right um and just for the for i i guess probably just to make sure that the listeners understand the treatments that we typically had back at that point where you can either cut something out by an operation. Unfortunately, lymphoma is a blood right. cancer. There's no operation for it. So then it all comes down to chemotherapy and radiation. Mm -hmm. And chemotherapy, let's just be straight blunt with it, it's poison. Mm -hmm. The concept of putting chemotherapy in a body is putting poison in the body that will try to kill the cancer cells mm -hmm. before it will actually kill the patient. And that's uh, it's it's brutal, but that's what we've had for so many years. 
now they're they've been getting in the last uh, 10 years now they're getting into genotherapies and things like that immunotherapies that is more or less trying to get a drug to that's like a like an advil or tylenol mm-hmm. or an aspirin that is something that's more healthier for your body that will go in and and trigger turn your cells that are turned off turn them back on yeah. Um, and that's where all the research right now and testing is, is okay. for the most part is going. Um, so, you know, we went in and out of the bone marrow, uh, transplant and, uh, um, and it was just very, very hard on him. Mm-hmm. It's, it's hard on the patients. They wipe out all of your bone marrow. So you have no infection fighting cells and they put someone else's bone marrow in and you hope that one, it grows and your body doesn't reject it. Um, and, uh, and it takes a while. It took about 30 days for him to get healthy enough to be able to leave the hospital. He spent his 15th year old birthday in there. Um, and we came out after 30 days and he started homeschooling his freshman year at West High. And, you know, we all know what COVID did with masks, right? right. And that's exactly what cancer patients have to do. Mm-hmm. And he had to do back then. Couldn't be around people. Right. If we did take him out, it was rubber gloves and it was a mask um, because he is such at risk immune of system was done. Yeah, immune system. And, uh, um, and about 30 days after that, 40 days later, um, he started complaining of headaches one day and, uh, um, and the next day he had a seizure and, uh, um, we had to take him back by ambulance to the hospital. And, uh, that's when they informed us that, uh, um, you know, that the cancer had spread and it spread into his bone marrow and it mm-hmm. spread into a CNS fluid up around in his brain and uh, that he is now in stage four. And he spent a week in the pediatric intensive care unit and we were just like, okay, waiting, okay, what's the next thing gonna be? What's right. the next thing? And, and uh, after um, a little over a week, they said, well, he's, he's actually healthy enough to go back downstairs in the bone marrow transplant unit. And then they told us that they didn't think that he was gonna make it. And we're like, I don't understand. What do you mean he's not going to make it? You know, we're going to be saying this. he's good enough to go back down. Yeah. You're thinking, yeah, there's an improvement. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, um, he was still confined to that room for 30 days. And uh, um, after 30 days, his white cells got high enough that they actually gave us the news that he could actually like leave the room and actually leave the wing and go out in the regular hospital on a walk. Um, and uh, and we were able to do that. And so we went out for that walk. And at that point in time, the steroids at Austin was on, the chemotherapy ate all of his muscles. Um, mm. And, wow. you know, you see, you see people from other parts of the world that, um, that basically their muscles are, they're all bones. Mm-hmm. And their, their bellies are still kind of bloated in their faces. Yeah. Um, and that's all the steroids and the chemotherapy. And, and so he was really, really weak. He had been confined for over 30 days to a bed. Um, and uh, so we sat down on a, on a bench in the hospital that day, and we talked to him about win the day. And we just said that, you know, we know cancer is trying to take everything from you. It's trying to take your life. But just think of all the positives. You know, today you didn't throw up. Right. We're able to leave the room, leave the wing. You know, we're able to pray together. We're able to hug each other and we'll be able to... Maybe they say that we love each other today. And, uh, um, and it's just a reminder that, that no matter what we're going through, you know, we have a choice. We just have to choose to find one positive. And, uh, um, and we got to tell Austin that he gets to decide what a win is every day. Mm-hmm. Cancer doesn't. And so when the day changed for us and for so many people um, that day. So as a parent, how... It, how going through this roller coaster of health issues, you know, he's getting better and no, now we've had this major setback and, Mm -hmm. and trying to be there for your child under the most horrible circumstances. How is it that you're able to focus in on basically when the day is, had become your core for athletics? How do you, how do you focus back in on, something like that and everybody can just kind of stick to it and say this is the plan (laughs) it it kind of comes down to that you know as we move forward like there were nights i didn't want to go to sleep with him 
I, I slept in the, the room right next to him on a cot. And uh, um, my wife did once in a while, but it was much easier for me to get ready in the mornings um, than it was for her. But there was nights I didn't want to go to sleep because I was fearful that I would wake up and he wouldn't. Um, so it reminded us that uh, we're in this and it is the worst, worst place to be in. Did and he understand the full situation at that point? Yeah. He did. Um, and he knew. Yeah. They, they told us that, uh, that at Thanksgiving time, we were in the hospital and there was no, no statistical cure for him. And uh, it was a heart-wrenching conversation to have. And he said, thank you. And he goes, uh, um, but we'll find something, right? <laughs> And uh, he wanted to fight so bad. Yeah. And as we think about this, and this is the what that still drives us every single day. We can, we can allow the negatives to creep in, and uh, um, but we got to find the positive and live in the moment. And our we did not want to waste one day with him. If we would have sat there and cried day after day, day after day, and we would have whined and complained and and got mad at people and saying, "You got to help us. You got to do something. You got to fix this." Um, we would be doing that right in front of our son uh -huh. and we'd be wasting a day and it comes down to easy as this. He's with us right now and we have to go to sleep and he might not wake up tomorrow and we w do not want to waste one minute and win the day for some people and even us at times in the moment had to be win the moment. Yeah. We had to find a positive in this dark hole to get us through this five minute, 10 minute stretch, to be able to make, get us to the next hour or two, to be able to get to the right. end of the day mm -hmm. and realizing that we still found ways to laugh and to smile. And sometimes we had to cry for mm -hmm. a few right. minutes. And, uh, but we didn't want him to, to we, we wanted to still create hope for him right? and create hope for the entire family. Um, and, uh, he was so amazing. He knew what was happening. He was a 14 and then a 15 year old boy that we had to be 100% honest with him. Right. You know, because this is his life. And, uh, and man, he was, he was the most grateful person we've ever been around. No matter how much pain he was in, um, no matter what he was screaming in pain in one moment while they're trying to do something to, to alleviate the pain. He would stop and he would put his hand on their hand and say, thank you. Um, he would say thank you to Jose and Cynthia, the janitors, every time they'd walk in the room. Um, he was truly amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, we, we were in and out of the hospital the, the, the last couple of months. We were back in for Christmas again. We spent all the holidays in there. It came all the way to March and, and uh, the doctor sat us down and talk to Austin about the train of life, that we're all on the same train together. But unfortunately, the train was gonna stop and God was gonna ask him to get off sooner than anybody else. And Austin's response was thank you. And we got sent home in hospice um, and uh, wondering as we had to get get him ready we had to help him get up every day he couldn't walk on his own anymore we had to get him ready in the bathroom and and all the family was coming to to meet with us for the weekend and and we said austin you know wondering if the cancer was you know taking over in the brain if he really knew what was going was still going on and and they're like do you do you know why the family's coming and he goes yeah because i could die any day and my wife, Stacy, goes, well, I mean, are you afraid, you know? And, and he goes, no, I'm, I'm not afraid. I think it stinks, but if God truly needs me, I'll be watching over you every single day. Mm. And uh, wow, we had a, a, few, a few weeks later, we were in, invited. Um, we were invited back to the children's hospital. And in one of the activities rooms, they had all of the con some construction workers and the media. 
And so the Children's Hospital, the Stead family that we see today that we get mm-hmm. to wave yeah. during yeah. the football games, that was being built while yeah. Austin was treating right next to us. So he never treated in it. And, uh, um, but they did have some of the final beams that were going to go up inside that the patients got to sign to be forever a part of it, which was amazing. And as we were waiting in a, in a, in a room right next to the activities room for our turn, there was a, a, a young mom that had a really, really young daughter. I think she was probably two in the room next to us and they got some bad news and the mom was crying and it just, just tore at our hearts. Yeah knowing that our son doesn't have much time left. Right. And Austin, all of a sudden, he goes, he, he said, um, you know, this isn't fair. And we thought, oh, my gosh, he's going to have this breakthrough moment. It, you know, it's finally going to, he's going to say, you know, his, this, emotion. his emotions, like, yeah. this sucks. And uh, we said, you know what, Austin, this isn't fair. And, and we are so sorry that you have to go through this. And, you know, as a parent, it's like... I'm a dad. I'm supposed to be able to fix this. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to do this. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he goes, I'm not talking about me. He's like, I'm talking about all these, all the, these younger kids. He goes, it's not fair that they have to go through this. And he goes, I'm going to beat cancer. I'm going to come back to this hospital. I'm going to talk to these kids about win the day, <sighs> about finding the positives, about never, ever giving up. Um, and that was the day that he made his wish. And uh, two weeks later, um, Austin went to heaven. And uh, in the hospital immediately, our family friends came from West High. They, they said, do you know if you add up the digits of the date, April 28th of 2015, 04282015, the digits equal 22. Mm-hmm. And then 22 is Austin's number in football, basketball, and baseball all throughout sports. Was there any significance why he chose that number? No. Okay. I mean, maybe there is now, but... Um, Interesting enough, you know, my baseball number was 22. Um, Okay. My football number was 23. (laughs) And and that just happened to be his favorite one. And uh, um, a few minutes later, someone texted and said, do you know what today is? Well... We Googled it, and April 28th is National Superhero Day. Oh, boy. Pretty fitting for a boy yeah. named Flash, right? Yeah. And uh, um, some other family friends, they got to the hospital, and they came in, and they said, you know, you have to get out of bed and come and look out of the window. And so we got out of bed with Austin and, and went to the window and looked up, and there was a perfect halo cloud right above the children's hospital. Hmm. All signs that it was his yeah. special day, and he's going to be watching over us. Right. So incredible. Unbelievable story. I mean, all those instances on his his last day are just really amazing. Yeah. But but what truly stands out is his positive attitude and his perseverance and almost, you know, looking over his family while he was there. That's just it's amazing. (laughs) Incredible. Um, how all those things, and I've heard you share this story in other groups already, uh, out, and maybe there's more you want to add to that, but is at what point did, did then you guys sit down and go, we'd like to some way get back mm-hmm. and keep his memory alive through a foundation? And maybe that's a whole nother. <laughs> no, it, this is exactly where it typically um, can go um, in the story. Um, this community is so amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, so generous. Yeah. For the funeral, um, there was so many things that were paid for right. by people in the community, um, businesses and everything else. And we had $22,000 that <sighs> we had, um, in donations after the funeral to do really? with what we, with what we want, you know, do a headstone, do whatever we right. want. Um, and we just we knew Austin's wish and that we just felt that, you know, the greatest thing that we can do is pay it forward. Mm -hmm. So we took that $22,000 and we set up the foundation and we did that in November of 2015. Right. 
And then immediately, um, a couple weeks later, we wrote that first check of $22,000 to the, the Stead family, the University of Iowa Children's Hospital, and the AYA Cancer Program, which is AYA stands for Adolescent Young Adult. And that is, a, that is the, the new group that is age 13 to 39. And so when Austin treated, um, before then it was 0 to 18, it was pediatric, and it was 18 and older, which was adult. And they knew that there was people around 18 that, do we treat them like an adult? Do we treat them like a ped? Well, are they an early bloomer? Or are they a late bloomer? Mm. Right. And sometimes it's not necessarily, is their body completely been, you know, growth, grown through puberty or anything? It's how internally they can actually almost like digest and actually have that, the, the drugs actually work in their system. But they, they realized that, uh, um, that, the same type of medicines were not working on this age group um, like they were with younger and with older. The problem with it is is that uh, um, that back then only one percent of government funding was going to pediatric um, cancer, so ninety nine percent of all government funding was going to adult. Wow! And so that there was zero for this age group. Um, thankfully, for people like Dick Vital, um, who we became friends with because of the McCaffreys and his crusade of fighting for kids and kids with cancer, that number now is up to 3% and growing still such a small percentage amount. Mm-hmm. Um, and there really isn't any really government funding yet for this age group. Um, really? And so it's been like our foundation and the McCaffreys have actually been supporting and driving um, the AYA group here, the cancer program here in Iowa City. Mm-hmm. That and with the help with the Dance Marathon, University of Iowa right. Dance Marathon has yeah, done some that's... big donations to help get us to do yeah. some testing and everything else. Um, for for our listeners that aren't mm-hmm. familiar with the McCaffreys, you want to give a quick recognition there oh my gosh they um (laughs) you know everybody you know sees fran in the limelight of coaching and everything else and and uh I will tell you that I was just about as uh, competitive as he you see him (laughs) back in the day right Uh, growing up um and uh but fran lost both of his parents to cancer and patrick coming down with cancer um you know at the same time as flash was amazing. Those boys had each other. Um, in fact, one point in time when, when, uh, um, Patrick had radioactive iodine put through his body, the family couldn't be within 20 feet of them. So he was in a, in a bedroom down in the basement. Well, they asked if Austin could be with him because they want radiation would be actually was something that he had to do anyway, and it would be good. Um, it wouldn't hurt him. So they actually were able to play video games for oh. weeks on end together. And Patrick always came to the hospital, Fran and Margaret, they, the whole family, they, they were one of the ones that we allowed to come in the hospital to come and, and visit quite a bit. Um, they have the biggest hearts. Their drive and passion to make a change in the fight for cancer is, is really, really amazing. And, uh, um, they will do anything for anybody. Um, and uh, I, I wish everybody got to know them like we do. Um, just an amazing, amazing family. So, Well, Franz, uh, uh, just so the audience knows, is the men's basketball coach or head coach for the Iowa Hawkeyes. Yes. So they came into the community, and uh, my first impressions of him is he's a very competitive person. Uh, and I think with what you've experienced, you've seen that. I yep. mean, they fight for the right causes. Absolutely, 100%. So just letting people know that. Yeah. But yeah, that was very unique that those two boys could spend that time together. Yes, yes. Yeah. Very, very unique, and they, it was great that they had each other. So. Yeah, that's great. So they've been a big drive for moving the, the research forward. Yep. And um, your, your foundation, I've noticed the checks that you've given always yeah. in, in a... 22. Yep. Every year since, what, 15? Was that your first? Our, our first one was 2015, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, to date, um, so far, um, we have raised um, and donated $850,000. 
Um, and I'm sure with all the 22s, I don't know what the end of the, the number <laughs> is now. Um, but uh, yeah, $850,000 to the program. And we we give gift cards um, to families at Christmas time and a, mm -hmm. a, a card from the foundation to let them know that they're not alone. Um, yeah. And because we know what it's like to be in the hospital, um, you know, during the holidays. Right. And so today, um, as of right now, we have given given gift cards to 322 families um, so far in the last eight years um, of doing the foundation nine years. Um, so uh, no, it's it's been amazing. And and you talk about us starting from 22,000 and then growing to 60,000, 22 to 100,000 for a couple of years. COVID hit, when, which was a hard thing. We were only able to raise 50 that year. But since then, we were able to uh, um, raise about and donate about 150 for the last couple of years. And uh, fingers crossed, um, we just had our golf event last Friday. Oh, nice. we, and we netted 70,000 from that. Um, our baseball event is always in June. Um, and we have a bourbon event coming up and a, a garage sale that we'll do. And if we end well and can do another 150, we'll actually hit the million dollar mark. Wow. So, Excellent. So, yeah. I've it's... participated in your golf event a few years ago, and you guys do a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Of, with that. It's always been fun. Yeah, we, we uh, it's a, it's, it's, we try to make it fun at the end of the day. Um, the last couple of years, our theme, our motto has been, let's get tropical. Um, <sighs> For those that don't know, it's another Will Ferrell movie, right. semi-pro. Um, uh, Jackie Moon and the Flint, Michigan Tropics. Right. Um, and that's kind of my my version for the adults to make sure that we have fun. So we have a lot of different fun games out there on holes to right. allow people to move forward. But it also allows us to charge some money and, mm -hmm. and make some yep. extra money right. from them on the yeah. course. I think everybody knows that, you know, that they're there to have a good time. And to spend money, and mm -hmm. that's what it's about. And and we at each of our events, um, baseball, um, we have some first pitch families that we have be a part of the baseball event. But uh, we also have uh, um, some some of the hospital staff and patients get to golf oh, in the event, wow. and we always have one or two of them speak along with the doctor and share their stories. But we do a marketing brochure that goes in all the golf carts with everybody's story. Um, and then we actually um, usually have pictures and, and their stories put up yeah. as well. So people that can come there, we're, we're there to celebrate them. Right. The ones, some of them that, you know, are gone as well, but some of them that are still fighting through it. And some of yeah. them that, that hopefully um, that are through it and maybe hopefully never have to deal with it again. So, so do they get to be your uh, superheroes for the day? They get to be our superheroes for for the day. Um, and I tell you this 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 last year, last Friday, um, Dr. Dickens really, really hit home after Helena Hilliard was the patient that spoke, and she was amazing. Um, but Dr. Dickens said, and he's like, does anybody remember how many patients I said that would be di diagnosed in this this next year from last year to this year? And nobody knew. Um, and he said, well, if you said 365, you'd be low. It's roughly about 400 new patients. And, and this he goes, is just in the University of Iowa. Yeah. And this oh is going to be just in the AYA group only, not just peds. Wow. And so if you look at it going, and he pointed and we looked right, it goes, in that hospital today, someone is going to get diagnosed and get the news that they have cancer or their son or daughter has cancer. And it just hits home. You know, we're here to have fun right. and and, mm -hmm. and to celebrate, but someone while we get to do yeah. this is now up there getting that diagnosis and uh, um, which is just not fair. Right. Yeah. So Well, it's incredible what you guys have done. Uh, where do you see some of the future of what you want to accomplish? Is this I mean, you're kind of on the path or do you have some new things coming? Yeah, I mean, I, I we're, we're going to continue to promote and fight the a you know fight for the aya group and mm -hmm. continue to fund that um you know if there gets to be the point that it's it's fully funded without us anymore um then we will take all of the money and maybe consider doing um something different with it um so so when people understand like like um phase one studies you know, what it all starts, it starts actually at the MRF lab here at the University of Iowa, a, a testing building that they actually they do. And that typically will start 50000 to $150,000 to pay someone to start doing testing. And so it takes 
time, effort, supplies, um, and expenses to do that. And if they find something that goes maybe to another level, then you're talking two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars to a next level of testing. Then you're going from it, if. If you're going to go to the next phase, it's probably more like one or two million dollars to be able to get something. Then if it looks really promising, then it probably is going to be picked up by a pharmaceutical company at that point. But those are the kind of steps to be able to get it. And you can't just saying, here's X amount of money, do a do a study here, because you need a doctor that would actually agree to do it. You need to set up all the protocols for it. Mm -hmm. And then you need enough patients. And a lot of times there's not enough patients specifically for that cancer. So then they have to reach out and do collaboration with other hospitals around the country that will be willing to do that same testing, testing right? the same type of thing, and then give the, the data and everything else over a time period. And when I say there's no, basically, um, for a patient, there's, there's no benefit for it, is that you're given this dose for this amount, this person's giving a placebo, and uh, if this dose seems to might be working and you're going, well, I want a different dose, you don't, you have to go through the, the whole oh, yeah. phase, the trial yeah. as is. You're hoping maybe, in, in our sense, if we would have qualified for something like that, that we were hoping that maybe that drug and that dose was the miracle thing for Austin right. or something like that. But at least knowing that what he is doing is could be helping someone in the future as well. So, so since uh, Austin's passing in the last eight to nine years, have you seen, are there new, uh, like new medicines and treatments now that are finding themselves to be more effective? Absolutely. Um, if, if Some people might have heard of CAR-T therapy, which is immunotherapy that is out there that work, that they're, they're working on specific types of cancer um, in certain patients. And hopefully as it gr goes, continues, that they'll actually start maybe trying it with a few other types of cancers as well and continue that on. And so that's the kind of the generation that I kind of said the direction that the, that the testing is all going immunotherapy and genotherapy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that there's promising things out there, but what doctors will tell you is if you imagine having a hundred doors and you have to open up and on 90 door 91, it, you open it up and it seems like, okay, we're going to take a step forward. Well, now there's 200 doors in front of you. Mm. And now you have to keep opening up and going into mm. those. And then you go into another one and you go you keep going to the point that now there is a door you can't open. And now it seems like you have to go back four more doors and slide over and try a new one to see if you have another direction, another door you can go in. And it's just, it's like a maze. And yeah. uh, um, it's, it's, it's a it's amazing to me that we haven't got there yet, Yes. but unfortunately there's been so much money and funds that have been going towards chemotherapies to try to get people to remission versus trying to get them into remission in a better way that's non-poisonous. Right. And also then where does cancer come from? Right. Yeah. What's causing it? Right. There's not much research information yeah. out there. I think so. I see a higher... Uh, I see more more of that information coming out, whether it be through food and different things, but it's not a big priority. No. And it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, and I understand body makeups and that, but when you see what's happening today and you go back, you know, 80 and 100 years, they weren't picking mm -hmm. it up the way the population does today. So there is mm -hmm. a lot of mystery around that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things I will say for our foundation that we do, other than raise cancer awareness, raise money for cancer research here and the cancer program, you know, and, and give money to families. Um, and I would say that, you know, giving them gift cards, but also in our events, being able to celebrate them and, mm -hmm. and share their stories. Cause a lot of them don't have platforms and, right. and, uh, some of them don't want to have platforms when we go through it, but, you know, we help with families and patients with diagnosis. If, if they want our help, if they want to reach out to a family that's been through it, and yeah. so they can read through our caring bridge posts all the way through. And, you know, what did we do? What was the next thing? And when we got bad news, what did we do next? And, and they can reach out to us. Was there anything that you would suggest we would do differently or, or somewhere else we can reach out to and go to? Mm -hmm. And, 
especially if they know that we're connected with like Dick Vitale and the V Foundation, the American Cancer Society. And, and it's like, do we have any other outlets for them? You know, and, and we're happy to do that. We're happy to help them with, you know, do you want a social media? Um, and, you know, do you want like a meal program and what are the ups and downs about doing that? And, uh, you know, what about money? People want to donate money to so, you know, setting that up and, but who's going to manage that? Because when you're in the fight with your, your, your kid, your, your kids, right. You don't have time to try to manage and reply to everybody. So you want a family or a close friend that can manage all of that for Mm -hmm. you. And we had that Ann Johnson took over all of that for us and it was amazing. And, uh, um, and so one of the things though, that, that we do is we help families with a loss of a child and it doesn't have to be cancer related. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we've helped, helped families that have had, you know, auto accidents or, or other accidents that, uh, you know, that that they've lost of kids. Um, we've helped people with mental health and have lost a child to suicide. And the reason being, and I remember, you know, we, we, uh, met Tater Tough, um, out of Williamsburg and their family. I've been wondering. About, yeah. yeah. And we met Great them. Family. We had three different people come to us and saying, you have to meet these guys because they're amazing people. And unfortunately, you know, Tate got a cancer diagnosis and, and, uh, we didn't know anything about DIPG at all and how bad it was initially. But, you know, we met them on, on, I think like on the, the first week after they were diagnosed and we met with them for three or four hours and then we got to meet Tate because he was coming in for a treatment, and uh, um, and we became friends, and and we were with them through the whole journey of twenty seven and a half months, and uh, um, and you know, the night before he passed, we had reached out to Brad and Darcy and saying we know that the time is here, and it could be any any hour or any day, and most likely it's going to be within the next twenty four hours. And we asked if they would like us to be a, be there for them. And we knew all their friends were right next door, right. not knowing what to do either. So we came over and we were at Tate's bedside with him, got to hold his hand, um, got to pray and, uh, um, and got to be there for them. Right. And then we went next door and we were there for all of their friends and what they can expect next and then yeah. what they should be doing for um, the Schaefer family right. next and how to move forward the next month, six months, the next year and, and mm-hmm. things like that. And, and I remember, uh, um, you know, our, our daughter said, just like, you know, why, why dad? Right. And it's like, because nobody should have to go through this alone. Right. Yeah. Right. We were able to make it through it. And, we can help others make it through it. And we don't want anybody to ever be alone. Yeah. And uh, anything that we can actually help, we're carrying Austin's, what his wish was. Yeah. Right. His wish wasn't just to go raise a bunch of money, it was to no. come back and help them talk to Serve him about others. win the day. Yeah. And, and win the day literally doesn't matter why. And when I sit down with, with the families, it's like, we have to go to bed tonight and wake up tomorrow without our child. Right. When the day can help us get out of bed, off the couch, and it can help us move forward in our kids' memory and their honor. We can continue to live the life that our kids would want to live and want us to live. And we can take them along with us, along with on the ride. Right. And uh, they can be a part of us every single day. And, uh, um, and so that's also part of what we do as a foundation. Right. That's That's amazing because as a friend or family member of someone that is going through this, you don't know how to be there for them. Mm -hmm. There's never any right words, I'm sure, but I can't imagine what you being there and kind of guiding them, how much that helped them and Mm -hmm. gave them some some type of peace and comfort to just guide them through it. Yeah, and I, you know, through speaking of Tate... uh, I've known his grandfather for years, just through our insur- being in the insurance industry. Yep. You know, just a salt of the earth family. Uh, he's the one who told me about Tate and the devastation. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he felt a little bit of what your your dad felt. Yep. You know, because here you've got this next generation, and you know, I'm just preparing to have my first grandchild. <laughs> but 
I don't know that feeling yet, but you know, I know it's very different than when it's your own children. So I can, I could see how hard that was for him, but going through losing my father at a young age, I, through a series of events, probably the most enjoyable thing I do in life is I help a local funeral home out that took care of our family and really helped us a lot through that process. And to, uh, when I started working with them about 15 years ago, um, and you know, they always, their joke is I'm their free help because they forget to pay me, but (laughs) I don't do it for pay. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's so rewarding. And I would ask, you know, questions of processes and procedures. And he said, you got to understand anybody going through this likely has never experienced this in their life. And when they walk in, they're froze. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to say, Mm -hmm. what to say to who, everybody. And you're going to see good, bad, and ugly come out in those scenarios. And really our job is to almost like a child, tell them where to go, what we're doing next, and keep them informed so we take all the confusion away of what it is that that family's dealing with that day because they're so overwhelmed. So uh, for you guys to do that, that to me is is a really big piece of it. Mm -hmm. You know, they all are big pieces, but uh, I have to believe you felt a, you know, there was like a certain finale or like final feeling of once it was over, you can prepare all day, but you cannot prepare for that. You can't, no matter what. Right. You know, and no matter what I preach to the kids and, and everything else, the attitude and effort and, yeah. you know, put a smile on your face and find the positives. And, and when something like that hits you, it, yeah, I it mean, just hits you. It just hits you. And, and it knocks you, knocks you on your butt. And, yeah. but you, so does life. Life continues to bring adversity right. and knock you down. And it's, and it's not how many times you get knocked down. It's the ability to get back up and the ability to move forward. And for me, and it's the ability to move forward and continue to live a life that my son would want us to live and continue to move forward as in my other two kids and my wife and my, my, my Mm -hmm. large family wants to live and we deserve to live. And I don't, I don't want it to... Listen, I'll say the big black hole calls my name. It still continues. Right. I don't care if people think that my wife and I have everything figured out. Um, we still hurt. And oh, for I sure. will tell everybody that uh, the way I look at it, and this is right or wrong, it's just the way I look at it. I have a huge hole in my heart, and that hole is always going to be there. But Austin has allowed me with God's help to be able to grow my heart bigger and stronger so I can love even harder and I can love more than what I did before. Mm-hmm. And that hole belongs to Austin. Right. And, uh, um, and I'm not a professional, um, and, and I'm okay with the way that I look at this. And I tell that to everybody else is that we can get through this. We can get through the, the really shitty times and the really shitty things that happen to us in life. And we can come out the other side um, stronger. Right. And uh, um, and so that dark hole calls our name. Yeah. But we continue to try to look at Austin, look at his lightning bolt as the light for us to continue to move forward, right. up and forward. And uh, um, we want to share that with other people. And when we talk about it, you know, we wanted to give Austin hope. Um this community gave us hope and Austin hope and keep us driving. Someone like Dick Vitale gives people unbelievable amount of hope. The hope that the, the light that Austin got when Dick would call him on the phone was amazing to see. And, and Dick still gives that to, to people. If we can give a little bit of that hope to, to somebody. And, and maybe it's the hope that, you know, we're going to get through this. My kid's going to survive and get through this. Or if it's after a loss of a child for a reason, if we can give them the hope that you can come out of a loss of a child and, and you can figure out it's not easy, um, but we can continue to move forward and get through this um, with the help of others. And uh, um, if we can give that hope to somebody, then that's a win for, for us as well and, mm-hmm. and for Austin. And, and that's a great thing. Um, the other side of this, too, uh, there's always room for grieving. I don't mm-hmm. think, I mean, I think people see you sitting here today. I mean, I can feel some of the emotion and see some of the emotion. But uh, 
those are things that are going to continue to be a part of somebody's life whenever they go through hard times or even a grieving of losing somebody. And it's a healthy, healthy thing to experience. It's probably something wrong if we don't. Yeah. Uh, I think what you see, what, what people see from you and Stacy is a lot, the, you know, the strength as well of overcoming, but I'd have to believe there have to be times you got to grab each other and, and something hits you. I mean, it I, does. you know, I felt it was interesting to me when, you know, years later, something would trigger, you know, a memory of my father over, you know, when I was young, I was just angry. Yeah. And then when you're, you know, have kids and things, you're like, oh my gosh, different events trigger. Different so, events. And, you and know, that'll keep happening for everyone. Forever. Grieving is, is, is going to, and that's the one thing I want to tell everybody is that if you're not grieving your entire life to some extent at different times, then, then I think that you're probably have buried it Yeah. to me, grief. And again, I'm not a professional here, but (sighs) grief is because of love. Right. Uh I still love my son and I still want him to be a part of my life as in if he was still living. And so naturally, there's going to be a song, there's going to be a moment, and uh, there's going to be someone that's going to come up to me and, and saying that, oh my gosh, you know, you know, I remember your son, and uh, when the day has helped me, you know, and during a struggle of my life, and uh, or having a cancer diagnosis of a young child in a family, um, interesting enough, as, as, as I got ordained and did a wedding, at that wedding, I met the a friend of the bride, and and she was knew our story, and she's like, I love when the day I use it, you know, teaching and other kids and stuff like that. And two years later, their three two year old son is diagnosed with cancer, and they use when the day every single post. They after they finish every single day at the end of wins for the day. Yeah. Trying to find the positives, and they're going to list them, and that's they list them because that is what they need to focus on mm-hmm. right. is those things to find a win for them, themselves to get through the next day, but their family to be able to all get through, and uh, um, those things just warm our hearts, yeah. yeah, and they touch us, and it's like I get choked up about it, <laughs> but I I love it at the same yeah. time, and the grieving is just the love of right. the love for our son. That's a great way to put it. I think uh, the grieving is going to definitely change on the amount of love that's been felt with that yeah. one person that's uh, moved on, and I can relate to that. I mean, yeah. that makes a lot of sense to me. I'd never really looked at it that way before, mm-hmm. so thanks for sharing that. You say you're not a professional. Um, usually what really constitutes a professional is somebody who has experience <laughs> and has <laughs> su- successfully navigated that. So, you know, I would probably argue that you're more of a professional than you believe. Uh, it may look different to you than some others, but thank you very much for what you do to the Iowa City community and all the surrounding school districts. I uh, really have no idea how many of those you've spoken at, how many you've impacted. I just know you guys also have some baseball teams now that are called Flash Baseball, and you guys have really given back in some of those fronts. Uh, Interesting, you know, there's stories amongst those kids and loss as well, so. Yeah, I I uh, look at it, you know, sports allows us to be able to give so many life lessons and learn, right? right. You know, and and that's all I ever wanted to do with the kids, And, and so... My goal with Austin's team, his 14U season, is I wanted to, to donate, and uh, I wanted to donate, t- donate time to the children's hospital. And he ended up getting sick, and we never got to do it. So Flash Baseball was, a, was with Tom Gorzolani and, uh, and his wife, Lindsay. Um, we talked about doing something like this and doing some things the right way. And, yeah, there are some contracts for players parents and coaches, because I think accountability is good. Yeah. Expectations, accountability, you write them down, they're there, right? Mm-hmm. The concept is that that we want to teach the game the right way. But more importantly, we have our teams do community service. So they actually have to sign up and give back to the community. And right now we have five teams and they range from, you know, like eight through like 13, 14. Um, and, uh, and so that is one of the greatest gifts that we can try to 
teach young kids the importance of giving back. And mm -hmm. uh, um, with all technology, with all the phones, their heads yeah. down and laptops or, or yeah. iPads, everything else, we can get them uh, to teach um, teach them the, the game the right way, to compete the right way, um, but we can also teach them the importance of giving back in the community, which, which, which I absolutely just love. So, so. Well, we really appreciate it. We appreciate you coming in. Uh, really, you know, want to thank you for the effort you've put in and how uh, vulnerable you and Stacy have been to share your story. It's uh, life can be hard. And it often really is, regardless of what and we look around and look at people's status and what have you, it's still hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think just being so open with what you've done has given a lot of hope. So we thank you for joining us on Mindset Growth Podcast. I thank you for taking the time out of your day to come do this. Uh, and I'm sure it's going to inspire others that listen to this. So we... we uh, would like for you, though, to share where people could find you. And if they mm -hmm. want to donate to the foundation, what do they need to do? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, this is great. I didn't think we we're even going to get a plug for the foundation for donations. <laughs> but um, we will always take someone's money. Um, you can go to uh, fightwithflash.org, which is our, Facebook, our, our, our website to be able to donate. Um, there are links if you go to Fight With Flash on Facebook um, mm -hmm. or Instagram. We have ways to be able to connect to be able to still donate that way as well. So, um, uh, yeah, if anybody, you know, there's so many great organizations and foundations and charities right. out there and there's more and more all the time because unfortunately there's more and more adversity that right. causes people yeah. like us to create something. Um, but, uh, you know, if anybody wants to consider the fight with flash organization, uh, you know, we obviously, you know, are heartfelt from it and very, very thankful and gracious for any, any, any donation. Absolutely. Well, thank you. So, Thank you for joining us on this episode of Mindset Growth Podcast. We hope that you really enjoyed our visit with Craig and listening to his story and the triumph over tragedy and how they support others going through tragic situations just like theirs.